Welcome back for our final game of the day. Hometown favorites, Fong Vu Buffalo, going up against SKT. And, you know, PVB, they would have been watching on as SKT picked a pretty clean victory just a couple mm -hmm. of games ago. But we know they're a team that can mix it up and get aggressive. And that's what I want to see from them here. That's what's worked against SKT. They can be caught in rotation, just like we saw from Team Liquid and matches past. So because of that, I think an aggressive style and a way to also stop uh, Clid from just taking over the tempo of the early game. Yeah, I definitely agree. And, and because PVB took down G2, you have to say, hey, there's, there's a chance, right? There is a chance going up here against SKT. And I have to give a lot of credit to Meliodas, who was such a strong performer in that game, went legendary on the Rek'Sai. I think he did look good throughout play-ins and had been subbed out due to illness, I do believe. But he is going to have a very tough challenge going up against Clid, who has been outstanding. Yeah, SKT coming off the win that they just previously got two games ago means they're already warmed up. They're looking to make this one happen. Easy breezy, one, two, threezy. But Fungvu Buffalo would love to put that second win on the table. Remember, this is the last game of the day, so that means only tomorrow's games remain of group stage, and then only the four top teams get to continue playing in knockouts. If Fungvu Buffalo wants a chance at that, got to start racking up some wins. Yeah, they definitely do. I mean, we're, we're down to the final game here of the second last day of groups. There's not a lot of time to get these wins, certainly. And you, you have to feel like it needs to be a messy game yeah. for PVB to be able to take down SKT. You know, earlier we saw SKT up against Flash Wolves. That was so methodical, so clean, you know, so very kind of slow and, and well thought out from SKT. That That is not the type of game you think Feng Vu will ever be able to match SKT. And they need no. to pick up the pace. They need to make SKT make mistakes. But then from the SKT perspective... You know, on the one hand, more of the same is not a bad thing. They had, mm -hmm. as you say, a very dominating win in their game earlier today. But you can't help but stand back and say, IG made games look so effortless with Baron. They just closed on one Baron, 8,000 gold Baron buff power play, and it was all over. I know that's hard to ask and doesn't apply to every team comp, but right. I want to see SKT make the game look as effortless as Korean teams have in the past. It almost seems like the perfect contrast between the old and the new. During the Korean golden age of League of Legends, this was how the top tier games were played. It was very slow. It was very methodical. It was a two or three Baron game, and you would whittle them down and make those low risk plays that would ultimately win it over a long period of time. Now that we're in the area where IG are the reigning world champions, it's fast, it's fun, it's definitely not Dominion, it's just <laughs> League of Legends in your face. That's true. It's definitely not Dominion. And uh, for SKT, you know, they certainly have the ability to take down these top teams. The question just remains, you know, can you play a game where you can be able to match and absorb that pressure from IG? You don't always have to be the one, you know, dictating the pace of the game. Responsive League of Legends can work and can be very successful mm -hmm. with the right comp and with the right players. So the question is, what does an SKT for fun game look like? Because we've seen the fun that IG has had. They've thrown out the unique picks, you know, they come in big favorites against Fong Vu Buffalo. We saw the Vi, and that actually ended up looking pretty mm -hmm. damn legitimate. Maybe you just run it again and say, hey, maybe Clid tanks a Vi ban in future series. Or maybe, just maybe, it gets more interesting from there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly possible. But, but I do think on the side of SKT, you still want to guarantee, you know, that top four spot. You want to lock in yeah. knockouts. You want to make I'm sure. I'm not asking for the Quinn, all right? This <laughs> time, I think the Quinn is a bridge too far. Well, I mean, you say, what does an SKT fun game look like? I pose the question, is fun even in SKT's mind right now? Remember, I think winning is fun for Faker. Yeah, this is a team, and specifically a player in Faker, that just had a reputation and an expectation of always being the best, wanting to go back to that former glory, and fun, that can come afterwards. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like the fun is around the corner. I believe the players are all in the lobby and ready to go. So Captain Flowers, take it away. All right, here we go. Into Champion Select for the last match of day number four. Fong Vu Buffalo against SKT. And the first ban from PVB is going to be one of those champions that causes a super safe version of League of Legends to be played. They'll bench that Kench. I mean, the Kench is all about the fun denial. So, so far, so good. <laughs> what we're hoping for in this game between SKT and PVB. Like we've mentioned, SKT 
BT. Big favorites in both their series today, but all we can do is look on their side and see if they can show us the decisive gameplay that has been the hallmark of this tournament. Yeah, these second bands here, no surprise at all. Teddy, deathless, as you mentioned earlier on the Callista has looked fantastic. And Meliodas, the Rek'Sai, which he used to take down G2. He really was the driving force in that game. And not only is Teddy exceptional at it, it's also another champion that provides a lot of save power. You can never mm -hmm. catch the enemy support when Callista's nearby, because she will always pull him to safety. They're denying that save. Silas, also going to be taken off the board, has been an incredibly high priority flex pick throughout the course of the tournament so far. Not surprised to see that one removed either. And where SKT fall back from here will be interesting, because something like Varus Braum, I guess the safest thing, you can take an Ezreal lane as well. They just aren't being given respect for things like Lucian Gallio, you know, these kill lanes, or Lucian Braum kill lanes mm -hmm. that other people have been running, very early game lanes. It hasn't been SKT's focus. We'll see if anything changes here. Of the flex picks, Jace, Akali, uh, Silas, all gone. Two left over, one snapped up by PvP. So many times we see it. Rise is left open. Rise is first picked by the blue side. Very common trend so far over the course of group stage here. And it's SKT's turn to respond. Aurelia is available, though, if SKT did want to go to it. That was another flex pick that people uh, certainly had mentioned. And Faker is a very strong Aurelia player. We did get to see him bring it out against IG. Unfortunately, that was not a very long display. Uh, certainly, you know, I think not on him entirely. But uh, would be excited to see him bring back out the Aurelia. Well, the Galio's locked in for the side of SKT. We've seen plenty of play with this champion as well, not only having those defensive options in terms of protecting people with the heroic entrance, but also just able to go so aggro. Flash taunts can really start off fights in any way you need them to start, and they're also going to be picking up the Jarvan there in the jungle. Yeah, for a duo that does something but doesn't necessarily pigeonhole a bot lane, Jarvan Galio is kind of knocking you over the head in terms of availability. will always control space, whatever role these champions are in. So definitely seems like team fighting, or at least at least being alluded to by the first two picks. And if Fong Vu Buffalo try to get scrappy, all of a sudden they find themselves thrown in the dunk bucket. The Cataclysm plus the heroic entrance means that whole area is controlled and controlled heavily by the side of SKT. If Fong Vu Buffalo will have to be very respectful of that as they pick up what is likely their own bottom lane in the Kaisa and the Nautilus. Yeah, and the Kaisa is always a nice denial away from that Galio. Many teams have been using this combination to great effect. And it will perhaps, yeah, it will be that Lucian Galio, as you talked about earlier. This is not a kill lane that SKT had been really showing. It had been fairly high priority for some of the other squads here. And they are going to get their own crack at trying to play that lane dominant style. And I love to see this because something different from SKT. It's not Ezreal. Let's let the support roam mm -hmm. around. This is we're playing through a bot lane. And Jarvan could definitely have a bot lane focus this game. There's been definitely a lot of talk also about the a Nautilus versus Galio support matchup. I know some coaches around MSI think of it as a counter matchup for the Nautilus. What I want to focus on instead is the synergy with the Kaiser, just because Nautilus, with all his forms of hard CC, applies the plasma so fast that you can get two rounds of the plasma explosion in kind of the blink of an eye the moment you hit level six on the Nautilus. Yeah, exactly. And not only that, but the ultimate is that guaranteed path in, point and click ultimate onto the back line. That gives Kaiser that guaranteed stack of plasma alt back through to try to have that assistance. Rise also a tremendous amount of crowd control there. Uh, so certainly a lot of ways to be applying that plasma. Well, as we get into the second part of the bands, SKT is saying, all right, we already denied uh, Meliodas, one of his main picks in the Jarvan. We already banned out the Rek'Sai in the first half. Let's go ahead and take Lee and Elise both off the table as well and really force him down this jungle tier list. Now the Fiora ban on the PVB side is an interesting one. It is, of course, a favorite of Khan. Uh, in years past, and the reason why I say it's interesting is it makes me think they want to play something like Aatrox top and get mm -hmm. away with it as a priority lane into things like Vlad, but also just a safe overall around, overall around pick because it can be so powerful in that top lane. Right now, SKT, they can still flex here. Again, the Aurelia has made it all the way through to the second round despite being the fifth and final remaining flex pick. Flex is locked in indeed. Irelia picked so often banned these days in these matches where the flex picks draw so much aggro during the band phase, but that one's locked in for either Khan or Faker, whoever needs to pilot it. And now the answer for PvB is, do you play the rise into it, or do you have something else you'd rather do? Yeah, exactly. And the fact that it did actually make it through both rounds of bands leaves me wondering, does PvB have something special planned for this? 
You know, if it were to go top lane, I do think things like Jax are such a powerful answer, but because SKT are on red side, they have less pick. This is a flexible pick that you can move around the map, which makes it certainly more difficult for PvB to do that. We did see in play-ins things like Renekton coming through, oftentimes as an answer, and this is... Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna... Okay, so it's gonna be Kane Jungle Hecarim top here. Very, very interesting, and that makes sense along the lines of the Fiora ban. That is a terrible matchup for Hecarim that we have seen play out here at MSI. Certainly, you know, can go very heavily in the favor of the uh, Fiora unless there is heavy jungle intervention, which we have seen, I believe, actually SKT demonstrating with Clit and Khan. So with the Aurelia locked in, they have a lot of options here. They will go the cannon after all, just for a ranged matchup to just punish the Hecarim mm -hmm. over time. That's the final call that's made by SKT. You can definitely say is it's a lot of CC, CC synergy to come over with the Kai'Sa come team fights. I kind of take your point though. It's gonna be very interesting to see if they can baby this Kane through the early laning phase, because definitely in top, you're gonna like things. The flexes will continue, but rise support, that's a bit much. Yeah, definitely <laughs> is. Uh, not gonna be tricked by that one. Come on, he's got a root. And, and I, yeah, okay. Lane presence, baby. Take a deep breath there, Captain Flowers. I'm gonna ask you to calm down. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so excited to see if they are going to be able to do it. I tend to think it's going to be very difficult because Kennen is such a preferential matchup over the Hecarim. They have a very powerful bottom lane as well. There are areas which Clit can attack. You tend to favor SKT in both the 2v2s and 3v3s oftentimes as well. So, you know, Meliodas is going to have to play very carefully to get through the early stages. He's going to have to play carefully, but he'll also have to play aggressively enough to make sure he transforms in time. Remember, base Kane, not a very threatening champion. You really come online once you get that evolution, most likely going for the red form because it is traditionally the more powerful one, and especially against this composition, Blue's not going to find too many targets, and that means early scraps, finding that damage, getting those orbs, because if he can't do it, those fights, those are already in favor of SKT, could quickly go even more so towards that side. Great segment from Dracos explaining those same points in even more depth, Captain Flowers, during Countdown today. So all about the cane, as it always is. On to Summoner's Rift, the final time of the day here. Taking a look at the runes picked up by both sides. You can tell I already was 99% sure it was going to be Red Kane. Now I'm 100% sure because he has the Conqueror. That's not going to do much for Blue Kane because you're looking to just snapshot somebody. So that's obviously where he's going to be looking to go. Conqueror for Hecarim, pretty standard stuff for him. But one important thing to note, it is the Ignite Teleport version of Top Hecarim that we used to see so often. But it means you're a very vulnerable gank target with no flash. Yeah, you certainly are. And Clid going electrocute is going to give him more early really ganking power than that of the Conqueror, which is more suited to those long extended fights in the 2v2s. That initial burst from the Electrocute can be so important. But I'm so excited to see how does Clid set up? Because almost every game he's played, he said, this is my lane and I'm sticking to it. I'm going there again and again and trying to create a mismatch in victories and defeats. And we ruminated on how this is actually SKT heavily attacking bot side with the Galio Lucian that loves jungle backup. Not quite as flexible as Callista to jump in and jump out for all trades, usually just hard commits. The reason why I bring this up is, if you're trying to counter gank bot lane, if you do set up a start there, obviously base Kane is gonna be awful, provides almost nothing in a counter gank scenario if it ends up being bot lane focused. However, to Captain Flower's point, the Ignite Hecarim can work with top lane focus even giving that it's a cannon. So there's actually a lot of different ways this early game can play out, and that could shape the great part of the mid game. And Meliodas is always a guy to watch for Fong Vu Buffalo, right? This is the one who can get them really rolling. This is the guy that they felt like not their full selves when he was out because he had to be replaced for a moment. But now that he's back, the team has been able to find that one win. We'll see what they can do against SKT as you can see Meliodas farming up that Krug camp. We're going straight back bottom forth, lane, Captain Flowers. Bottom lane. We'll see if this level two gank from Clid can work. He moves through the lane into the brush and really wants to get things going here nice and early. Mata walking up into the brush, making sure Pallet has to stand far back enough that he can't sneak through the brush and ward that forward one on SKT's side. Yeah, and credit to PVB. They're playing this safe. They're sitting back. Hey, this was a lot of time invested actually here by Clid. He went red straight to bot, then waited in that brush. 
This is now three camps to the one on the side of Meliodas, and he is looking like he wants to perhaps play around mid to start charging up that red form. You have to be attacking those melee champions, which leads you to believe Faker may be where he's going. And as Meliodas finds all these camps, one thing you have to remember about Kane, the champion is exceptional at farming, especially chicken camps. Number one chicken farmer in League of Legends. You can see just W plus Q nearly kills all the small ones, picks up the large one immediately after. And if we can call out the scenario where every bot side 3v3 is lopsided to SKT, PvB should as well. If they had died to the gank, it should have been an expected one. In this case, they trade up, they power farm the Raptors, like you mentioned. And right now, Meliodas has a very nice level lead and definitely gold lead over Clint. He'll farm up that scuttle crab there in the top side river. You can see right now the stakes of what's on the line here as SKT will secure a spot in the knockout stage if they win this game. Fong Vu Buffalo, plenty of work to do if they still want to fight for that themselves. And we're going to see a replay of a cannon minion. He got it! Oh, uh, oh, oh unfortunate there. Eat. So Khan making Woo. an unlucky flash forward, not or the utmost of asserting dominance. Exactly. I don't need okay. this flash here. Well, that's one way to look at it, I suppose, but Khan will not have that summoner spell now, no. which means it could be a much easier gank for Meliodas if Khan stays this far extended. He did it very conspicuously, mm -hmm. so I hope it was with his chest <laughs> out. We know that Khan yeah. can be a trash I mean, Zeros uh, doesn't have flash. He's in ITP. It's only fair, you know. Look, we're casters. We're going to have to go with Occam's Razor. It's a whoopsie. <laughs> Definitely a whoopsie from Khan, and it's something that can be exploited. Remember, mm -hmm. Ignite Hecarim starts to push back in. There's no flash. There's only the lightning rush to escape. But they are looking like they want to set up this dive. Zeros has been harassed down, and they may go for it. Conqueror Hecarim with the Spirit of Dread heals up a lot over time. But if you kill him instantly, he's not that tanky. Clint looking to make sure he secures that CC combo. And there you go. First blood to SKT. Really impressive for SKT to wait as long as they did. They waited for the end of the touch bot lane, though. They're not going to be waiting much longer here on the bottom side. Big Koro getting himself away as Palace going to hold off Teddy and Mata. But that's three summoner spells from the side of PvB expended there in trade for two from Mata. Yeah, SKT trading up on both sides. Meliodas making his way down here. We'll see if they can punish. He'll use there by Teddy to start things off. Mata still channeling the taunt, looking to find someone. Won't be getting it. Khan makes his way into the bottom lane now, but won't find a whole lot. Still a great gank from Meliodas, forcing that out will mean Zeros has more time to try to catch up. He can push in this wave, reset once more, and reduce some of that deficit that he was put into because that experience he lost was so critical in the 1v1, and now that really has been evened out. And he's going for a roam as well, just walking around, removing a plant, getting the sort of space that you never get in a range oh. versus melee matchup as the Hecarim. It's going to find him, but not going to be taking any aggressive EQs. Yeah, and look at the inventory of Clid as well. You can see the longsword being picked up early on. This indicates to me the warrior Jarvan as opposed to the Cinder Hulk that you frequently see, coupled with the electrocute that was already mentioned. This means really, really powerful ganks, especially once he gets one more level and Cataclysm comes online. And also in terms of the Kane interaction, he doesn't want to play into the heavy expectation of Ross that's kind of confirmed, like you mentioned, Flowers, with the Conqueror. Just be a heal bot, just be a sack of meat that you can ult and get a huge heal during a team fight. So he just goes for the long sword, and it gives him a bit more early game home. He'll clear out this bottom side scuttle crab, maintain control over that one, provide a little bit of extra support for the bottom lane as well, as we've seen how aggressive Teddy and Mata like to be. Extra vision in the river will always help make sure those plays can happen. And we can see Meliodas taking away another set of those chickens. You know, he's out to, to a pretty strong early game as far as the farm does go. This is actually his first base at 6.30 into the game. We'll see what buy he has, but definitely power farming very heavily. He wants to be getting up to that level 6 stage, but he also does need his transformation, and he has not really been fighting very much on this map, which leads me to believe he's going to be very far away from getting it. And an important thing to mention about the blue smite specifically for Kane, you do see the champion often go for a red smite when he's going red form because it helps you become such an incredible duelist, but Blue Smite gives you this bonus advantage of always being able to use your ultimate. Speaking of ultimates, in the mid lane, Faker's gonna make this one happen on to Null, continuing to go deep underneath the turret as Clid stands by to soak the shots and make sure he's in no danger. SKT making a two kill game. Both the turret dives have been very good. We were cut off discussing how on the top side they waited out the charge from the Hecarim and then went for it because of course, couldn't take those extra turret shots, didn't have the flash on the cannon. In the mid lane as well, damage output is known. They get out safely and top 
side, Cled. His job's not done. Yeah, Zeros with the wave, pushing to his opponent. They're going in. Zeros is stuck. Oh, there comes your Wombo combo, and the Cataclysm is down. No way for the horse to escape. That was just awful from Zeros. That is such an obvious gank. As soon as the ultimate comes out from Khan, you need to immediately drop your ult in retreat and just count yourself lucky that you survive. Instead, waiting far too long there, not only does he expend his ultimate, he gives over the kill. And Seemed it to have some sort of hope that it was just Khan trying to push in the minion wave and harass, but very quick confirmation and no chance to be ultra reactive and only a blue buff can come back from it. We're gonna watch the two plays. Remember, this is twofold from Clint. Comes mid lane, a lot of jungles pull out here, goes in, gets the electric U damage, and those long swords were important. Yeah, and you'll notice he was tanking those turret shots for Faker to be able to go forward, making sure there was no chance of that dive going wrong. And, you know, Zeros being held down pretty heavily here. You need that Triforce so much on the Hecarim, and he is such a long, long way away from working on it. Meliodas is farming chickens. Clid's farming champions, making sure he's been involved on all these kills so far. And the top lane has already evolved into an over 1,000 wow. gold lead for Khan's Kinnon. You think Kinnon's a lane bully normally, give him that kind of an advantage, and he is just going to start taking your lunch money. With only a, a turret plate and two assists, feels like he's been pretty lucky on the sacks of gold, I'm going to say, because that feels like a really big lead for what it looks like in terms of the CS numbers. Khan will definitely take it, of course. Thing is, it's so hard for PvP to swing this game because their jungler doesn't really add much when he shows up. You kind of want yeah. Hecarim to be TPing in, and Hecarim's got his own problems. So right now, SKT can kind of be fearless in the face of the enemy. Yeah, and this is, this is some of the concern that I kind of had from PvP. When we talked about what sort of a game we wanted to see them play, it was chaotic, it was aggressive, it was nonstop action from the start. Kane is trying to avoid everyone in power farm. The Hecarim is so far behind the curve, and it feels hard to think, you know, at what time is this Kane actually going to be online? You know, Rost is still such a far way off that by the time he's actually going, is he even really relevant anymore? Baker trying to get the stun there onto Null. You can almost guarantee that Clid's coming in with his own follow-up if that lands, but Null just barely gets out of the hitbox of it. Continue farming up here in the mid lane on the rise. Does have a very slight CS advantage over his opponent. Meliodas spotted out there by a control ward as Nall gets himself stunned, but he has Pallet nearby in case SKT looks to make another play with it. Clid coming around from the side, walks over Control Ward, but is not going to be dissuaded. Nall immediately jumped on, as here comes the heroic entrance from the Galio. The follow-up CC is down. Nall's going to be taken out. Monta secures the kill as Pallet has to flash away. More damage oh. coming through, goes into the stopwatch to dodge the Vanguard's edge, but more damage is on its way in. PVB have already lost two, it may be three. The taunt on Meliodas will seal four. the deal. They will lose Mata in return, but SKT go three for one. Yeah, and SKT just too ready for that play, despite the fact that Pala had roamed. Mata knew it was happening. He's in position for the counter gank there with the hero's entrance, and SKT make it look easy. And on the side, Teddy was winning the duel against Big Coro. That was almost a fourth kill going the way of SKT. And could is their decisiveness factor. He doesn't care that he's in a control war. There's not an EQ range. He knows that with Galio backing him up, Jarvan and Galio do what it always says on the tin and make the play work. I was impressed with the mechanics to immune the ultimate there, but sadly, it's just a bit of gold, so just a bit of flash. They still pick up all the kills in the back end. It's becoming a very one-sided game at 11 minutes. A small silver lining on the cloud is Meliodas finding himself a kill in return on Tamata there. Of course, because he's also involved in a fight, it will get him closer towards that transformation. But still not having it means he's still not where he needs to be. As you can see, Faker putting down some vision there in the river. SKT knows how far ahead they are in this game so far. Look at this bottom jungle on the side of Fongbu Buffalo. You can see Clid and Mata moving up, sitting down control wards as well as those regular vision wards, making it so if anybody's moving around in the Fongbu Buffalo side, they're aware of when and where they're doing it. And those are turret diving wards, Captain Flowers. The Warrior Jarvan wants to go and make some more aggressive plays, go on the longest route possible, and he'll take a cane if he finds one. And I want to bring up the point that you mentioned about the Hecarim needing the Trinity Force, because you can see Faker Zyrelia already having his Trinity Force ready to go as Hecarim has a Ruby Crystal. Not exactly comparable between the two itemization sets, especially considering the Hecarim had to rush the completed Mercury Treads to try to keep himself safe against the Kinnon. Faker's going to continue flashing and dashing here around the mid lane as Mox is going in that bottom side jungle. They don't even need to dive the turret. Fongbu Buffalo's coming straight to them. Big 
Koro tries to dash his way out with a killer instinct, combine it with the flash, and he'll be okay. But now, they're trying to counterattack. It's Zeros into the middle of four. He's not going to be surviving too much longer, and Teddy will take the kill. It's 2-0 for SKT so far. Faker wants to make it three. Pallet stunned up underneath the tier two, and he is not long for this world. SKT is running over the Buffalo. Yeah, PVB feeling they needed to make a punch back there, trying to get something, but Meliodas is already down. Big Koro already was getting push backwards and as Zeros TP's in, as you pointed out, yes, he had a base to buy the Sheen and the other longsword, but he is so far away from being relevant in this game and SKT know it and can run the map. But people screaming for a killer instinct from SKT should watch replays like this. They're way deep. They're fighting near the inner turret at only about 13 minutes into the game. Even the TPs, like you say, the own behind is not there. Great stasis coming through from Teddy. Big Coro can't even get access into the fight. Yeah, I mean, Big Coro had, had no sums at that point, had already blown the ult. There's no way he could follow up, even if it was a more powerful Hecarim. And SKT are absolutely running over this game. Turret plates are not even down. And this is a good contrast to what we saw last game when we saw Invictus Gaming fall behind and say, hey, this is a team that knows how to minimize losses, not overcommit to a fight that has already left their court. Fong Vu Buffalo do overcommit. The teleport from the Hecarim. Big Coro and Pallet sticking around way too long, and it just means that a small loss becomes a big one. And they're now in a spot where they're down five and a half thousand gold, 13 minutes in. Pallet now could be in some trouble, taking some damage. Tries to return some onto Khan here, but Faker's made his way into the fight. It's going to be two versus three, but SKT are not even afraid. Ignite used, but Pallet will not be dropped. So if you're Fong Vu Buffalo, you got to worry about how bad that fight looks with the main advantage. I mean, it's it's still a base cane. He still hasn't even gotten the upgrade of 14 minutes in. So Meliodas, you know, still not really online. And when you give a jungler like Klit so much room to work, you are seeing what the game can look like. Mata going to be engaged on here on the bottom side. Pallet looking to make this one happen. Khan going to be taken low now as well. Meliodas trying to do something. He's going to be stunned up underneath the turret. Big Coral, the one to fall. Zero's coming in, looking to grab some damage onto Khan, who goes into the stopwatch, keeping himself a Live, trying to find a return kill here. It's Meliodas who gets away from the turret shot, and that's Fung Vu Buffalo getting themselves a two for one in the bottom side. But at what cost? Faker's pushing up with the Rift Herald here in the mid lane. He's got Clid and Teddy at his sides, and they'll take down the tier two. Absolutely no answer to this. Plenty of AD on this Jarvan to keep the push going. Should be able to interrupt the final charge. And they got the Ross. Finally, the transform does come through there from Meliodas just before 15, but a nice hook onto Teddy. Pallet trying to make this one happen. Teddy very low on mana here as Mel makes his way into the fight. Teddy's going to be taken very low. Kept alive now by Mata, oh, and oh. what a save! That's the heroic entrance. That's what it's made for. That one hurts so much for PvP. Teddy, so low, no flash. You have to think, great, we finally got a free pick. We finally are going to get some control. Instead, SKT answers, Teddy survives, and they take the dragon. When even the lazy recalls and flashing in the face of your enemy under no pressure can't be in roads, then sadly, this game seems to be passing PVB by SKT, trying that aggression, being able to do it in style. And now PVB just trying to outnumber and find what kills they can. Meliodas tries to go for a flash into a knockup with the blade's reach, but unfortunately the reach isn't quite long enough. Khan's gonna get himself away oh. as Big Koro gets himself solo killed in the top lane. Teddy makes sure of it. Yeah, Teddy nicely played there for him, but on the side of PvB, you know how behind you are. They have to take risky plays. They have to look for these sort of picks. They are just not working out, and it is putting SKT even further ahead. But honestly, from this disadvantage, you can't sit back. But from the very early game, when Kane got not much of a start, we kind of laid it out there that PvP can't really fight back until a point. The jury's out on whether that point will ever be reached. The reason why I want to visit that is the other side is SKT have a lot of advantages they can push, and to their credit, they have. This has been a game a bit different to the previous seven from SKT. Is it the opposition? Is it just a once-off? We can't know today, but we were focusing on whether SKT could show gameplay traits that would serve them well, coming into taller opposition as the tournament goes on, and from that side, you give it a pass mark. You certainly do, and now for me, 
the report card becomes how quickly can you close out this game? Right. Can you have that killer instinct to take the early Baron, to use that to close a game? Or will it be more of the standard SKT style? Take a Baron, get some more turrets, reset and play it out slow. PVB trying to start the fight here onto Khan, who has completed the Zonia's Hourglass first item, which means he'll have that stasis ready to go every 90 seconds. And you can see the gold difference on your screen right now, descending into the two, not 2K, excuse me, 8K territory for the side of SKT, and Zeros gets himself dunked. There is no way out of that one. That's the gray screen territory coming through for the Hecarim. They want this out of turret and continue the snowball that has already been on. By 20 minutes, 10,000 gold lead should be almost an inevitability. Teddy continues to power up, so do SKT. Yeah, and it's these kind of games that for a top laner, for a damage dealer like the Hecarim, feels so, so bad because you're so far behind the curve as far as damage, you cannot threaten anyone. And likewise, you don't have enough survivability to live through any of these fights, and it's so hard to feel like you have any relevance at any point in this game. I mean, that's the double-edged sword of a carry top laner. If you get ahead, you are the fear of God in your opponents running into the team fights with the teleport. If you're behind, you're just wishing you picked a meatball the entire time, so at least you had some CC. And that's why we focus on the big five flex picks, and we don't really include the jungle top flex pick Hecarim. Now, that wasn't even leveraged this game. Mm -hmm. They were taken in the same round of the drop on the blue side in the second round, but Hecarim's matchups can quickly turn away, and this was even after the early mistake from Khan. Very comfortable for the Kansas. Yeah, that's certainly the case. The one flex pick that I'm wondering if it should be added to the pool whatsoever is the Nico, which has been popping up more and more. And Vladimir for some teams. Certainly. And then the Nico, you know, has had, had mixed success, but certainly does seem perhaps more promising. Well, what's not promising right now is the outlook on this game for Fong Vu Buffalo. Eight and a half thousand gold down, not even 20 minutes into the game. Baker continuing to push up here on the bottom side, going after Big Koro. Lots of Buffalo members nearby. However, SKT is also coming down for the collapse. PVB smells it, and they get the hell out of town. Map state here for SKT. Pretty dominant. Baron hasn't spawned, so we can't be talking about any misfires around that objective, but it's been a while since PVB have been able to explore that vision. So looking over some of the map states here yeah, and, and drawing a line. The line of vision oh, for SKT. That's, you don't hate to see. Yeah, that's you, you very get, that's, accurate line this time. That's, 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 that's essentially none of your camps are available to you, and that is the line that has been put in place by SKT. And that is the dream line of any team when you're on the winning side because it says you're getting the minions or monsters we decide you can have. SKT in full control here, and with Baron spawning in 10 seconds, with that next Ocean spawning here in a little bit over 30, you can bet that neutral objectives will continue to be the focus for them as they control the entirety of Summoner's Rift. I do want to see how fast they go for the Baron this time around. They don't have the Azir plus Kalista combo from last time in terms of the raw Baron shredding damage, but they're still so far ahead. They've still got so many items. You can see Lucian having the Blade of the Ruin King plus Essence Reaver in inventory. He will do plenty of damage to that. It's very easy to take it down. And when you compare it across the board, a Storm Razor plus the pieces of the next item for Big Koro, it's just not a comparison. I believe you have the two Evolves, but you have nothing else. You're very much just at the minimum there. But at level 10, you might not even have the two Evolves. It lets you know that right now, still very much in the building block stage. And with that Baron, that's probably just the game end. 10% shy of the Supercharger Evolve for Big Koro means he can't even have that stealth in the middle of the next fight. Khan and Zeros going one versus one here in the bottom lane. Zeros down a level up against Khan, and even if he tries to go for the all-in, he's still got to deal with the fact that there is that stasis. Yeah, and he does have the Triforce, but unfortunately for him, and he's been so outpaced, when you look across the board at someone like Faker, he's on Triforce plus the Sterics already completed. And, you know, when the survivability, the luxury items start to come through for these members, it becomes harder and harder to take them down. There's Zonia's parts of a GA already there for Clid. There's the Sterics, likely a PD could be coming through as well here for Teddy, and you just won't be able to press that mark. And sometimes the item tell a story and obviously you can say this one has more that means they're going to win team fights but the one that i actually want to talk about is both the warrior jarvan and the fact that it was a zonia's rush very early zonia's from kennen it tells you we're fighting and we're brawling early we're not going for proto belt for lane control they were with the mind of diving both the Hecarim and around the map, and it lets you show that they ha were jamming the Accelerator based on their item choice. And I think they're going to continue that with Clid actually going back, you know, finishing the GA instead of trying to go to that Black Cleaver. That tells me you are looking for the one-punch fight, but PVB trying to catch Faker out. 
Null makes the Realm Warp in there. Baron has been angered, so he's going to be putting some damage into these guys, but Meliodas now taking some of his own. Realizes it's probably time to retreat. Clid moves forward. Faker's not forced to even use the Flash. SKT will expend the teleport there from Khan, making sure he's ready for the fight if it breaks out. Clid continuing to pressure forward. Throw down the flag, get himself over the wall, just in case somebody's sticking around, he's ready for that punish. But from this far behind, 10,000 gold, forcing a teleport on your side is actually a win for PvP, so that's a good move from them. They couldn't turn to anything. Hecarim gonna be hitting on this outer bot lane turret, so it's just a straight up win from PvP. And now SKT, as you do when you're from ahead, you try to turn it into something. SKT are saying, we've got a 10,000 gold lead. You may have gotten a tier one turret, but now we dare you to challenge us on this real objective. He's got no wards to even TP on. Control Ward already down on top of the Scuttle Crab there to make sure SKT are aware of any wards that might be around for the side of Fongbu Buffalo. TP now being channeled by Xeros. He wants to make sure he's able to make it into the fight as it starts. Meliodas looking to find the knockoff, won't be able to find anything. Big Coral under threat. Khan looking to go into the back line. Meliodas already expending the Khan, ult already expending the Kane ultimate. Is not going to be in a good spot. Vanguard's edge onto two. Big Coral going to be in some trouble. Killer Instinct barely keeping him alive, but only for a moment. Null is now the target, and he will be torn to pieces. SKT find three. But only just Captain Faust. They needed every bit of that 10,000 gold lead because they were trying to do this game in fast mode. They were skipping steps because they could. And that's what the best teams do. They understand when they're ahead. They overforce, but there should be big reward. The reward is the Baron. 16 to 3 now for SKT. 11 and a half thousand gold up. They didn't even lose the Guardian Angel on their Jarvan. And let's take one more look at how it happened. Yeah, here it is one more time. SKT do not go for the 50-50. They turn for the fight and Khan shoving members out. But you can see Clint down very low. Khan chunked low as well. But it is up to the carries. Teddy is bigger here to really make things happen. Yeah, towards the back end, they're able to just get in there, use that flashes and get the cleanup kills. The Baron's the primary objective. They'll take it. So while PvB able to get a little win and get that first teleport, the end result is Baron. And now is when we get to answer the question posed earlier. Can SKT go for the jugular? You have a 12,000 gold lead. You have Baron ready to go. And you have everybody alive looking to push. How soon can you pop that Nexus? Right now, they're going to pop two members of Fong Boo Buffalo. Null's got no way out. Meliodas will look to buy some time. Khan uses the stasis to keep himself alive. The red smite tick will not be enough. Zeros is farming the top lane. He has no TP. And SKT will march it down. Bot. Yeah, I think they should be able to end right now with Zero still in the top lane with two members already down on the side of PvP. SKT could try to push in here for the win. SKT in two lanes at once. Khan making his way down to join up with the team. He did go back to heal up after nearly dying in the bottom lane fight, but two inhibs already in the dirt means things have gone from bad to worse for Fongbu Buffalo. They say, hey, there's no reason to continue fighting here. We're not going to end right now. Regroup, push up again as a group, and then end the game there. Khan in the one versus one against Zeros, able to take him down very low, but not quite finding a kill until he comes back in with the proto belt for the 1v1. Definitely playing with his food on both sides there, but Zeros doesn't have the items to pull that off. The ults have been late defensively, which makes you wonder about the Hecarim pick that, as we mentioned, was not a flex pick. Last time we saw SKT first Baron, didn't break the base. We commented on how it was a pretty shallow lead, I believe, an inner turret. The only thing they added, this time two inhibitors to SKT. And you can see SKT now grouping up for the split push yet again. It's Faker in the mid lane to make sure the super minions that already exist are going to be enchanted with the Baron buff, while Clid, Mata, and Teddy march down top and look for that last lane of standing turrets. Realm Warp's not going to accomplish much of anything, but now that it's down, SKT are aware that that repositioning tool is no longer on the table. Tier 2 turret under siege, but it won't be for long. It'll be dropped almost immediately. Faker will be buying some time here in the mid lane. Now turning it right back onto the side of Fongbu Buffalo. Null just can't find any luck in these fights. And Meliodas will join him shortly. Clint continues the fight into the bottom side. On to Zeros and Pallet. Zeros gets away. Pallet will not. And SKT will clean this one up quick. 26 minutes in. 1v5 for Zeros isn't going to do much of anything. You wanted a swift win. There you go. SKT, take it home. We posed the question, and SKT provided the answers here. A very dominant game once again, but this time showing more of that killer instinct that you wanted to see. Playing aggressive. They are the ones dictating the pace of this game and not afraid 
to push in and try to close this one out very quickly. And games like this are why I've always been very particular about my language around SK Telecom T1 at this tournament. They haven't been a fast team recently, but the way I described them on the opening of the show was a chameleon. They played all styles over the course of this roster, over the course of spring season, settled on most recently. The slower style typified by the Azir and not a lot of rotation, but they can play fast as well. With a team this talented, how could they not? Clid, Faker, and Teddy, all zero deaths by the end of that game. You said they forced things around the Baron pit. It could have gotten sloppy, but it didn't. They recognized, importantly, how severe their lead was. They capitalized quickly. And this looks like a team now that going into those bigger games tomorrow, people can continue to have that faith in. There's another version of this game where it ends up being a second Baron, where they don't take that fight because they understand, okay, we kind of overforced this. Our t that TP is a bit of a blue. Not this version. This version is the version they wanted to show before that important battle against IG tomorrow. Well, SKT closed out day four in style. And to give us a rundown of the game and break down the entirety of the day, let's send it over to MSI Cooldown. <laughs> Thank you, Captain Flowers, and welcome to MSI Cooldown, where I'm joined by Jake, uh, Spawn Tiberi, and Sam Kobe Hartman Kensler to break down the action from the fourth day of group stage. First off, how are you guys feeling? I know it's been Great. an intense day. What a day it has been. <laughs> You're, Is that your real response? You that's, know, my real, that's my real response. You're a lot more chipper today, Kobe. Have you regained some faith in, in North America? Perhaps? Yeah, you know what? You hit rock bottom, you bounce back up. That's my philosophy. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to hope that they can keep bouncing because as an update, uh, IG have now locked first seed. Uh, congrats to them. I think no surprises to anyone. SKT and G2 have now also locked top four. So essentially, there is one spot remaining. Three teams are locked, but it's still a battle for that last spot in the knockout stage. And the Korean representatives join G2 and Invictus Gaming. Meaning the number four seed will be fought over by Fongbu Buffalo, Flash Wolves, and Team Liquid. Uh, you know, so it is in theory possible for us to have some crazy intense stakes as Fongbu Buffalo could make the last minute wild run. But Fongbu Buffalo, not who I'm interested about right now. I want to get your guys' impressions on uh, the respective representatives of EU and NA, and I want to start on the side of G2. Spawn, Ooh, interesting. you got to cast these games. I'm yep. curious, what, what did you think of G2 today? I thought that G2 had a pretty mixed bag, to be honest. I think that uh, what we saw was that they were willing to throw down with both teams that they played against. Uh, but we saw, you know, the controlled fashion and playing towards their win conditions in game number one and then kind of buying into the IG playstyle again with maybe a team comp that didn't necessarily fit it. And what I wanted <laughs> to see was a little bit more of that control and I guess patience shown and on the biggest test, which is IG, and don't get me wrong, they do seem quite unfallible at the moment, uh, fell down a little bit for me, but still promising signs. I, I like the creativity of the final call to try and end the game. Uh, I, th that call in particular did give me some hope for this team in a best of five, even against IG. Yeah, I really enjoyed watching this game, even though, uh, as you're pointing out, yes, there were some more tactical options that people yep. were looking for G2 to opt into, the 1-3-1, uh, you know, Tom Kench more side play, rather than so many of these skirmishes. But those skirmishes and oh, those fights oh, and were incredibly well played by both sides, and they were super fun to watch. So I'm still glad that we got the yep. game we did. I understand the entire team running bot lane to try to end the That felt pretty <laughs> tactical to me. Well, uh, the thing was is that it was a good play because they were capitalizing on the shy split push. And if you think back to the game, they actually did a couple of times. One of the times they attacked him as he had warded over, over the wall, they got his flash and they reset up the gank. Uh, so I think that's a great call. When Rookie stopped his channel, I actually thought for a split second there <laughs> that they had won the game because it was a genuine 3v5, but, you know, hats off to people like Ning and Jackie Love who just time and time I, again. I, I was going to say, I held it for like a good five seconds yeah. and then I saw Jackie Love auto attack someone with uh, the Z like virgin active. Hell, you're yeah. like, and we're all dead. We're all dead. I guess this is how we go out. But it, it was, was close. Nice run. It was. It was close. And I think, are you in the same position where you're hopeful in the best of five? Do you think G2 is going to be in a position to take games off? I of am. Games? I'm yeah. super excited for that best of five. I, if the best of five is filled with games like that, uh, then that is going to be a treat. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. On the opposite side, though, TL. Not quite in the commanding performance that they were expected to be in coming into the tournament. We knew that they would be in battling for fourth. We just expected it to not be quite so close of a battle. However, game one was the game where you could see that this is a team that when the conditions line up and when they get that advantage, they are very good at closing out a clean game. And this, once again, poses so many questions for me about TL because 
when they had the comp, when they had the Tom Kent, when they had the bottom line set up for success, I mean, Impact's playing well this tournament. They, they had so many promising signs. Yeah, I think they kind of backed up what a lot of the other players were also saying about this team, uh, Liquid. That, like, that was their, what, fifth game in a yep. row that they were able to take over Fangbu Buffalo. Um, with their controlled style, they are able to definitely get these wins. Uh, you know, over the teams that are below them. But then when matched with the ones above them like this in the Invictus Gaming uh, series, just in the first three minutes, you know, yeah. dying in mid lane, then dying bottom lane, then dying bottom lane again, that kind of is one of those, your heart drops into the pit of your stomach moments. I still got hope again, though. Like you're saying, impact, if you're putting on a single player yeah. here for Team Liquid, coming in, making a big team play for them, and having this big resurgence for TL actually made me look forward to tomorrow. That's why I started the show a bit more happy um, because I still am holding on to hope that they can take the game off of either G2 or SKT. I wouldn't favor them, you know, in a best of five or something like that, but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that they beat either of these teams. And so I think that TL still have a shot to go up. And I kind of started the day off questioning the resilience and then the adaptation of this liquid lineup because I said I thought that they looked a little bit dejected in their losses. I mean, they had lost four in a row coming in today. And then I was questioning, you know, they were playing split push comps, but they weren't committing to the split push. Well, today we actually saw that they went back to supreme comfort and team fighting, even dropping their solo laners further down into the draft for protection around the coal met. Uh, control majors and team fight picks and then they took it that step further when they picked up the Nico once again it was a team fighter they were a little bit late on some of the team fighters with uh, team fights which is what I want to watch for going forward but I think they've finally like got an idea about how they want to approach the meta in this tournament and that's a great place to go into uh, the last day. and for me hearing that from a lot of people that impact was going to be this huge weakness I just yep. kind of want to echo what you're saying there Kobe and that I've been very impressed the Aatrox game versus wonder he obviously did very well surprising us the Nico pick I was told this guy would literally live on on tank duty forever and that was the best thing that could happen but he's or gangplank or gangplank uh and he's shown so much more but now as we go into tomorrow flash and tl feels like the ultimate question pvb trailing and as we look at the schedule coming up i want to look at some of the key games the games that are going to matter most in tomorrow's schedule for deciding who is actually going to advance in that fourth place spot so of course the day kicks off with sk telecom t1 and team liquid these will be the final games of the group stage so where are your guys' eyes at? Where do you see the good, easy wins for Team Liquid? Where do you see the difficult matchups? I know you've already talked a bit about it, Kobe, but what game are they gonna take? Well, uh, there is no easy win uh, for Team Liquid on the schedule. They are definitely both wins that they will have to work for. Um, difficult matches with SKT and G2, as I mentioned, but coming into this tournament, our goal for Team Liquid, as most people have them ranked fourth, was to be able to take games off of the teams ranked above them. SKT and G2 are the ones within striking distance. They get another shot at both of them. So I think that it is actually likely that they take one of those games. Which one would you pick? I, I would honestly actually take the G2 game. Okay. Um, I think that there is that possibility, as we saw even where, where G2 have had throughout this tournament where they themselves lose sight of what their win conditions are even. Yep. As, as same uh, vein that Team Liquid you know, had split pushing, did not split push and started team fighting, uh, similar thing happened. But that's not, I don't think, what most people are going to be looking at. It's the Flash Wolves versus Fong Fu Buffalo, because if they lose that one, then Team Liquid, uh, and even if Team Liquid lose both of their games, then that would give them the edge. Yeah, it's a difficult spot to be in where it feels like to a certain degree you control your own destiny, but if you can't find those wins, then you are just put out and you're put in behind position. Uh, to round this discussion out, as we look forward, let's assume Team Liquid do make it in. Is this a team that you think gets stronger in a best of five against the likes of, of G2, of SKT? Uh, God forbid for their sake. I gotta be IG. honest, I don't think so. <laughs> I was going to say, because the thing that we're talking about a lot with this lineup is the inability to play the big five flex picks and I don't think that playing you know five games in a row on the same day if it does go that far makes that problem any easier I do have I think that uh you, you do have to trust in kind of the star players to have one or two of those moments in a series that can win you those games and if they come early enough in the series then you know things like momentum become a big turning point so what the, the short answer to the question is no I don't think this is a team <laughs> that will push very far but I think that you know, I, I do have some faith in people like, you know, Doublelift and Core JJ to have some standout performances in games. Yeah, and honestly, in the you know, knockout stage, I expect them to be picked by IG. So you're, you're asking me if 
Team Liquid's going to be stronger in the best of fives when they're playing a best Wait, of five versus IG. So the best part is I think Spawn has a theory on this that I really yeah. love. Uh, so <laughs> they IG, when they won Worlds, said that it didn't feel like they'd won Worlds because they hadn't gone through Faker. Now, I don't know whether this is Faker in best of ones or Faker in best of uh. five. But I have a theory that potentially... And I don't know, like, most likely that the support staff of IG <laughs> like, also no. think this is a dumb <laughs> idea and tell them no. But I think that IG will want to go through SKT. A special request final. by Rookie, and yes. he's like, I need this. I have to beat Faker in this tournament in a best of five, so we're picking SKT, is how you told That's me. my theory, because, I mean, they're a team that, you listen to all their interviews and they're about the fun, jovial games. And once again, I'm sure the support staff hates hearing that because even their coach was like, yeah, we need to clean up some of our errors. We look beatable at the moment. But so you don't think the two games in group stage is going to be enough? Yeah, I think. And, I, okay. I reckon Rookie hey, wants Faker. Here's a follow-up. Do you think that Rookie is not confident enough in SKT that they could beat G2 if that's the other, other semifinal matchup? I get, think that that is a big question mark right now for SKT. I think that G2 has definitively shown that they are the better team. Now, the thing that we have to take into account is because we were both there and I got very excited in 2016 when RNG <laughs> looked unstoppable and SKT looked like they were falling apart, that SKT do ramp up as the tournament has gone on historically, but there's only so much plot armor can save you from. And right now, G2 look like a beast of a team. Yep. Absolute monsters. I'm, I'm so excited to see actually what the matchups will be, who people will select. It's going to be such a, an intense moment tomorrow as the standings shake out. But now for myself, the casters, and the entire broadcast crew, thank you for watching, and we'll see you tomorrow for the conclusion of the MSI 2019 group stage. Good night. <laughs>If G2 Esports take down Flash Wolves right now, they will guarantee themselves a spot in the top four at MSI. Let's find out whether or not they can do it as they take on Flash Wolves here. Soul Shackles into stop one. Wally Death comes out, and G2 obliterate the first kill. Betty Chase turns around, back into Perks. They trade one for one. This is a slaughterhouse. G2 guarantee themselves a shot in the playoffs. The Devour Spit does come out, but some of the Flash blown by Core JJ. Oh. What was that damage piercing arrow? Chain of Crunch just starts to spread. Palette's gonna get locked down as the Cataclysm comes out. Seraph will fall after. It's a double kill for double lift. I thought you were Tom ulting me away. <laughs> He's also gonna be around mid lane, but it's plenty of manpower coming yeah. for SKT, and that's all she wrote. This is popping off for SKT. Chelsea drops to Baker. It's four dead on the side of the Flash Wolves, and this could not go better. Finding the enemy jungler, Clint's gonna be on the back line, able to find the damage onto Rather. Going into the stopwatch, keeping himself alive, and the Flash Wolves are out of there. That's just, that's stay on top. Nice, nice. Can I'm I, can alive, I can I'm alive, I'm alive. Yeah. Nice, nice. nice. Good shit, good shit. Oh, and a good through attack by Lon's able to find the initiation. Ning's got the kick down on the double who's gonna be in some trouble. Shy in the multiple people. That's a slicing maelstrom. Liquid not on the same page. And IG hits him with the whole damn book. Alan trying to make this one happen. Teddy very low on mana here as Mel makes his way into the fight. Teddy's gonna be taken very low. Kept alive now by Mata. Oh, and oh. what a save! That's the heroic entrance. Zeros gets away. Palette will not. And SKT will clean this one up quick. He's one one with the shy. Oh, oh boy, boy. His way to Mickey. Mickey will put some damage. There's good damage in the fly. I did not expect that to happen. G2 Esports, have they bitten off more than they can chew? One, two quick kills. Perhaps trying to do a little bit back, but Jackie Love, Invictus Gaming, remains undefeated at MSI 2019.